I'm gonna tell you, when I first heard the first Jaco Pastorius album, I said, well, maybe this will just go away. Maybe people will forget about this. I can never play like this. This is amazing. How can one man be playing these harmonic chords, melodies, and soloing? No, but this is unreal. I don't believe it. Okay. Listen, we got to ask this question. You've literally played with or worked with a who's who in the music industry. But we got to ask you, how about some of your favorites? Who who were some of the favorite people you got to work with? one of the greatest electric bass players of all time. He oh, was yeah. rated as one of the top 100 electric bass players. And he's a man that I also um, admired and studied. But then you went on to play with B.B. King, Wilson Pickett, Gil Scott Heron, yeah. Freddie Hubbard, George Benson, Herbie Mann, Janice Ian, Laura Nero, Rizzo Franklin, Roberto <laughs> Flack, Al Cooper, Thad Jones. Yeah, who's who? King Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Almond Brothers. I mean, how how did you get that good? There was a bass solo you did with King Curtis on a song called Memphis Soul Stew. Oh yeah, and that was. I guess you would say that is the defining moment in your career that just made everything change. So, so I just built upon that original Latin. Um, bum, ba -da -bum, bum, ba -da -bum, bum, bum. Specifically, straight Latin. If you grow up in New York, you're playing with Pucho and the Latin Soul Brothers, Willie Bobo, and Ray Monti, and um, everybody else in the Latin world. This stuff is secondhand to you. It was so funky and so hip. When I heard Jaco Pastorius the first time play, I said, hey, he had to have been listening to Jerry Jermont. And of course, later on, he came forth and said, yes. <laughs> you were my inspiration. I actually lifted some stuff that he had gotten from you to amalgamate into his own unique style, which he brandished with Weather Report and Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you were the one person in the world that Jaco Pastorius let do an exclusive interview on DVD about his music and his particular style. <laughs> How was that, dealing with Jocko? That was an incredible experience. But getting back to Jocko, um, he inspired me. He inspired me quite a bit. Um, Before you met him? Oh, yeah. I heard what? Jimmy Tyrell, who um, was the senior bassist in the studio when I came in, in 64. He was the man. Him and um, Bob Bushnell. Oh, yeah. Um, Richard Davis, they were all playing electric. Everybody was trying to play electric bass in the, 60s, in the early 60s. Ron Carter, yep. that, was, that was my competition. Richard, Ron, anybody else who could pick up one, everybody was trying to do it. Um, so um, Jimmy was the main cat. He was the cat. In fact, I did my first recording session. I was with J.J. Jackson. On, well, I should say one of my earlier recording sessions. Um, I was with J.J. Jackson. And he wanted, he hired me as an arranger. He didn't wow. hire me to play the bass. <laughs> he saw so much of my musicianship or whatever he saw that he said, no, I want you, to, you write the part. You arrange the song. I said, okay, I had to write out the bass part, the guitar part, the horn parts, the all the cats that I was working with during that time. This is like sure. 1965, I guess, 66. Um, and um, he sent me the record because he moved up the ladder after he left the studio. In 1975, he sent me a copy of um, a pre-release of Jocko's record, um, the first his first record, Jocko. 
And um, we never kept in touch, but it's funny. He found out where I was living, and he's, I don't know. He probably called me because I just kept the phone with radio registry. So he called me and got my address and sent me the record. I said, wow, this cat did the work. Could you play a little bit of um, that for us? Okay. I haven't played this in years. I don't really remember it. But no I'm excuses. Just... Hey, wait a minute. This ain't an excuse. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> That's tough. See, I did the same thing I was talking about up here with, a, with F sharp, a B, and an E here. Mm -hmm. Got the E in the bass, then I, I went up to the third, just as if I went to the B of the G on the open string, right? And just... So I got... Then I got, you know, G sharp, then I got D sharp, then I got A sharp. So I got like a flat five, major seven flat five, or E major seven flat five. I'm going to tell you, when I first heard the first Jocko Pistorius album, I said, well, maybe this will just go away. Maybe people will forget <laughs> about this. <laughs> I can never play like this. This is amazing. How can one man be playing these harmonic chords, melodies, and soloing? No, I mean, this is unreal. I don't believe it. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it will just fade away and everyone will forget about it. You're right. But they didn't. <laughs> no. It kept growing bigger. And next thing you know, the word on the street for anybody playing bass, have you heard Jocko? Mm -hmm. Have you heard Jocko? Yeah. You need to hear what Jocko was doing. Mm -hmm. It was so scary. I said to myself, I'm going to go see Weather Report just to see if this guy is really as good as the record makes it seem. I went to, I went to the Beacon Theater. They were there. I went around 3 or 4 o'clock to buy my ticket. They happened to be uh, doing a sound check. Mm -hmm. And through the doors came Teen Town. Ripping oh. through the doors. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> it's this real. dude. I mean, all the articulation. I said, oh my God. I can't wait to come back. And when I got back that night to the concert, it's Joe Zawano's group. But everybody's chanting, God, go. Yeah, I'm old, right. I'm like he was amazing. Put yeah. it that way, you as you know. Yeah, he had the he put the time in. When I first heard the record, first my first reaction was somebody put the time in because all the things he was doing I had heard in my head numerous times, and you know, but never put the time in. I was playing with, with harmonics early on because that's how you tune the acoustic bass with harmonics. So it's a natural thing to play, you know, playing. But he got into the false harmonics, yeah, playing okay. a song with harm. I mean, he just went. The places where I never even dreamed of going. Hey. And nobody did. That's but right. he heard it and went for it. Right. This was his whole persona and personality, which is, that's why he vibrated to me, because I did the same thing. I heard it, and I went for it. I was well, scared to death at the time. Him. But I went for it. Yeah. yeah. Now, Jerry, were, you, were yeah. you scared? Were you scared when you were in his presence? Like, wow, I can't believe I was going to ask the same question. Yeah. Well, you know, the first time what motivated me when I saw my Saw, saw my mojo working that I could really play and influence the music. I was um, about 13. I was playing in a church 
You <laughs> love this. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a habit of when I'm playing the music, I feel good. I rub up against my bass. You know, I'm playing the bass and I'm kind of humping the bass. Uh-huh. And I noticed that a girl in the audience, every time I do something, she do something. I said, whoa. I was saying she's feeling it. And every time I play a different note or a lower note or a high note, she react to it and besides me humping the bass. I mean, she was just picking up everything I was throwing out. So that like that was a defining moment for me to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this no matter what. No matter what fear I have, what trepidation, I'm going to do this because I, it feels good. I'm making people feel good. And I might just get some along the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, we got to ask this question. You've literally played with or worked with a who's who in the music industry. But we got to ask you, who, how about some of your favorites? Who who were some of the favorite people you got to work with? Well, uh, um, Aretha would be number one. Um, she gave me, um, this goes back, Nina Simone. Um, I mean, they go from, from well. Let's my talk about Aretha Nina. for a minute, Jerry, if you don't mind. What about her was for you was so special to be able to work with her? I mean, we as listening to her is one thing, but to be with her and working with her, what was it about her that that made her one of your favorites? <sighs> a lot there. Um, mm-hmm. This, you know, the physical attraction, mm-hmm. the um, the musical. Um, virtuosity. I mean, I grew up with her from the age of like 14, 15, listening to her um, on Mort Seeger. Played a, she first came out playing jazz with, um, on Columbia. And so I was right. hip to the then. Sure. So I was always a, a fan of hers from the very, from my first early re- Columbia mm-hmm. recordings. So mm-hmm. it was like a, a goal of mine to someday, hopefully, once I, you know, belong, you know, it was in the back of my head that hopefully I'll have the opportunity. And I got the opportunity. It's also in my book and a very elongated story, but basically I was called to a session. There's a lot of history involved with this, the music business. I don't want to digress, but she, when she crossed over to Atlantic, they wanted to put her in a whole different realm of musicians. And, but during that time to make that crossover, I was making demos with um, different people around. I played, played, a lot with the hit, played a lot at the Hit Factory, owned by Jerry Ragavoy. And he was friends with Jerry Wexler. And I found out years later that they would share music and they would send the music um, back and forth from stuff he did at the Hit Factory. He was in the Jerry West Atlantic and Jerry West was sending it down to Rick Hall in Alabama mm-hmm. uh, to fame recording. So they've been getting our music fed to them for a number of years um, by coming from New York. So... When I did get the opportunity to play with Aretha Franklin, they had all the musicians from Alabama playing, and they had called Jerry had had an inkling that um, he would need me. I had worked with Atlantic before. I did some rascal stuff. I did some. They called me in for one date when somebody didn't show up <laughs> for a ten o'clock session. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, I can make it." You know, I go in there scared to death as usual. Park my car in the um, Columbus Circle. Um, walk across the street. Um, and there are 25 musicians in the studio waiting for the bass player to show Ooh. up because they all got their part. The They've been there on. since 10 o'clock. Boy. I get it. You're walking there at 11 o'clock, and they said, it's one tune we got to do. And I explained to me that it's for, for Wilson Pickett. And they said, that he's going to sing in Italian in the first part, and then he's going to go into um, English in the second part. And I said, okay. He showed me the music, and I said, okay, what, what am I going to do here? What can I do? 
that's gonna make it sound good, basically. I wasn't even you know, just make the music sound good. Right. And I heard the run, they played the what they was I read played the arrangement, ran the arrangement down. And I saw where I had like four bars of like there's nothing going on in this great buildup. So right. I strategized and when the red light went on, I played something that's, you know, top of my head that wasn't on the chart. And that was they loved it. it. They loved yeah. it. You know, <laughs> and it was released in Italy the next the next week. Wow! So that was like one of my entrees to Atlantic Records. Um, they got my number probably from Ken Curtis because um, I had worked with him prior to that. This is like a nineteen, I guess sixty seven, sixty. Yeah, but sixty eight was a good year for me. So was sixty seven. My father spent many years working at Atlantic Records. CB, I know that, and I he would be very happy to know that you and I that. are doing this. You know. <laughs> Who else, Jerry? Who else was was right up there that you really enjoyed working with? Your, one of your favorites? Um, Nina Simone was great. Although we didn't have much of a rapport, you know, I didn't have much of a, a social rapport with anybody. But musically speaking, I grew up with Nina, so I've had the good fortune to play with most of the people, a lot of the people who I, I who I admired, whose music I appreciated, who nurtured me, um, coming up in the civil rights era. Leaving um, the Jim leaving Jim Crow. I mean, the world was in a ter terrible state um, yeah, as it is yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Nothing yes. has really much changed in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, so, music of, of a message was very important that we express ourselves. Everybody was expressing ourselves. Folk singers, they're all telling the story. Bob Dylan, the Peter Paul and Mary. I mean, you can go down the list of people who are yeah. influ influential um, in terms of social consciousness. So, Nina was at the top of the list. Okay, mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte. Um, many of musicians, they would be, Nina Simone was the first one, basically, that said, wow, I'm really making it now. This is like a 1965, 66, my first year playing electric bass. So that like, kind of like, let me know. I got encouragement along the way. Then she hired me to make her records with other artists. So I was hearing my music in the local stations on the radio for the first time, um, with the Swordsman, a group that he and her husband had pr produced. And so um, all these stepping stones, all these little steps along the way um, give me inspiration, gave me inspiration, gave me um, hope and faith that I could, um, I was on the right path. Jerry, when you were playing with Miss Simone, Nina Simone, was Leopoldo Fleming playing percussion then? I think that name sounds familiar. Okay. Um, the piano player, um, Rudy, Rudy Stevenson got me on the on the. Oh um, yeah, session. great guitarist, guitar banjo player, player. sure. Guitar player, Rudy Stevenson. Yeah, guitar, banjo, yeah, he was a contractor yeah. also. Yeah, I met him on a gig. Okay. <laughs> I had to have, I, that's the only way right. I didn't go out as a kid. I understand that you played on the recording of Mr. Bojangles, is that true? Yeah, Jerry and Jeff Walker. Wow. That was one of my first Atlantic, one of my early Atlantic dates. And is that the same arrangement that Sammy Davis Jr. L later did? I think Sammy was we first. I don't know. This is nineteen. Had to be nineteen sixty-seven. I hadn't heard. I never heard the song before. Right. As you know. Right. This was. Um. You can do a search and find out what year it was recorded and compare okay. the notes. But yeah. um. I'm not sure. But the man you um, recorded for, he's the writer of the song, right? Jerry Jeff Walker. Yeah. Yeah. He's exactly. The writer. Yeah. Exactly. Sure. So okay. that's probably the first. Maybe that's the. First, you know. <laughs> I've lived a long time. <laughs> I know. I know. What was it like working for BB King, uh, Roberta Flack? And George Benson. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> was BB big... <laughs> easy to work for? Um, you know, you, when you say working for, um, playing the great thing. My goal was to be a studio musician. Once I um, when did I, when was that became my goal? Oh, Richard Dubin. When I was um, playing with the Mixed Birds, I was uh, fourteen. Uh, no, I was 15, no, I was, six, I was 15, 16. He introduced us to the world of um, studio work because he was a young kid, young white kid with a receding hairline. He looked like he was 30. Mm -hmm. He was 16 at the time. Mm. He looked like he was 30 and talked like he was 40. <laughs> okay. So he can, he can go downtown and go into all the jazz clubs and um, venues back in this time. This is like 19... 60, 61, 62, and come back to the band with all these stories about famous musicians mm -hmm. and what they were doing for their lives, what they would do, what their day was like. They would go from studio to studio to studio, making jingles, 
films, records, you name it. And so I said, I want to do that. <laughs> so once again, I made a proclamation, basically something like I want to, I want to play the bass. Now I want to play the bass in this setting. Okay, so that was right. the next step of my evolution. And I was still playing upright bass here. Okay, really? so I didn't know when that was going to happen. I got Eddie Gomez on my head. I got Charles Mengus. I got Richard Davis. I'll never play like them, but yet I want to be, mm -hmm. you know, in that realm. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I mean, I worked for radio. They, uh, people were booking jobs for me. And I take, you know, this whatever comes that I'm taking. Okay. Whatever, you know, whatever. I don't, I, the, that was part of the joy of the job for me because I never knew what my day would be like. I had bookings. It could, I knew it was going to be a film or a commercial, but I never knew the complexity than what the music was going to be, the style of music, sure. whatever. So I'm like, what like genre? Every, every genre, any, and I say, I'm ready. You know, that was the whole idea of doing that kind of work. The mm -hmm. uncertainty, the adventure. The, and, the with that, and with that comes a certain amount of uh, unknown pressures. Oh, yeah. But the thrill was, <laughs> the pressure, the thrill of doing it was something over uh, trumped the pressure, so to speak. The pressure right. was there, but you know, pressure makes diamonds. <laughs> oh, yes. It also <laughs> had to be very exciting not to do the same thing over and over. You you were challenged, right? Exactly. I think the challenge is important. That was the that, you, answer you hit it. That yeah. was the big challenge. Yep, yep. And so after a while, you get to a point where you get like, um, well, God, can I play today? And having a limited arsenal of weapons, of repertoire, and um, that most musicians would have, I was always limited. So it was a, the challenge of what to do was always a um, issue for me, the pressure. So I would make up games like, okay, today I'm going to play as many notes as possible. <laughs> and tomorrow I'm going to play as few notes as possible. And that would be my way of getting through the day and being creative and playing something that was truly original and doing it in a certain manner. I mean, mm -hmm. some, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I had to go back to just being myself. But, you know, mm -hmm. but I had something to work with at that point. I needed a, a formula so much to get me through, to, to ease the pressure, so to speak. Sure. So I made up um, that kind of game I would play with myself. You played with some of the world's greatest rhythm sections, including Bernard Purdy, I'm quite sure, Richard T, right? Mm hmm. Cornell Dupree. Yeah. Hugh McCracken. Hugh McCracken. Vincent Bell. I mean, these cats who were. Um, the cat who um they were the top line musicians. Al Gorgoni. I mean, there's, there's so many cats in the studio. Harry Lukowski. I mean, these are the guys I work with. You know who I listen to, and I ended up sitting next next to them, basically across from them. Mm. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a quite um experience to play with the people who like you know the kid listen to. I'm blasting their music out over this over the speakers, and here I'm playing with them in a live situation, making history. Yes. Okay, because you're making recording, you're making history. So with BB King, it was just I was just the, the producer's call to call people who's going to make the job is go flow as um, as seamlessly as possible. So you call the right musicians. Mm -hmm. um, this is where it starts with calling the right musicians and the right arranger, and that's how the BB King's things. Um, got done. Basically, they called the right producer, the producer called the right contractor, and the contractor called the right arranger. And the producer was not known to be a producer. He was actually an engineer, a, son a, son a sonar technician, but they, he got an opportunity um, to record a live album with BB, but they didn't have enough time. They had more, they needed more stuff. So to complete the project, he decided to do a studio project. Okay, so he's not really traditional cat from the industry. He was outside the box, so to speak. And he said, well, let me do a studio version. We got a live thing, and we got to just do a studio thing. So he called a, a contractor um, who was had access to musicians who he knew about who would be able to get the right people, which would name me Herb Lavelle. Okay. I'm the drummer. Um, he had worked with Bob Dylan and got Bob D Dylan's music together, so it was appreciable by people when he was when Bob was with Columbia they didn't know what after his first album they didn't know what to do they decided to do a studio album and Herb was on the studio album him and Leonard Gaskin the great bassist the two of them they put the music together and the rest was history so um Bill knowing that called Herb to work with BB on get the musicians with BB 
Right. And um, and BB had an inkling. I just found out recently that he was up to changing his music. He was open to a new, a fresh page. And this time, BB was in 1969. He was born in 25, so he's like 40 something. Okay. He's looking to like you know possibly expand. And um, I walk in there dumb as hell in this regular session, not knowing you know, hey, Herb is here. That's cool. I got the session call. I knew um, Hugh McCracken was there. I knew Hugh. I didn't know Al Cooper. So, but the three of us got together and we made the, completed the album. It was called Live and Well. And I don't know the well side came, why I sing the blues. And after that, it was an instant hit over the summer. They said, hey, you got to go back in the studio. We went back to the studio in November and recorded completely well. And a bunch of other, we just just laid track after track. We had enough stuff for two or three albums. (laughs) And they used it on another album they didn't call us for. For another album they didn't, they said, okay, we want to try to, we can do, we can do this out. We don't need them guys. We can do it ourselves. And they, you can see what happened. Not too many hits after that. That's how the BB thing, BB King worked well. It was very well to, you know, I admired his work. And the funny thing is, I worked with a guy named who the band mentioned Honey Boy and Leo Morris. I was introduced by introduced to them by a guitarist from Jamaica named Ray Shinnery. He was a Jamaican blues man. He had a heavy, heavy Jamaican brogue platois, but when he sang the blues, he sounded just like BB King. <laughs> 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 and so when I finally met B.B. King and he, I said, I'll play what I played with Ray. Mm-hmm. And it worked. <laughs> you know, everything B.B. did, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I changed to one and two and one and two. Immediate transmission or trans, um, a transcendence of his music into a different field made everything he did like stand out. More so mm-hmm. than locked into the one, two, three. Yeah. Not that the trips traditional blues. So it made right. it non-traditional. It was just a simple switch that I turned on, which I'd been doing for, I guess, most of my life, basically. Um, so it was nothing new to, to try something new. And now, see George Benson, George Benson, how was that? Because he's he's a master technician. Well, that was a studio call. Once again, um, that was like, he was like, whew, way up there, like B.B. King was way, everybody was way up there. I'm trying to stay stay, stay, stay afloat in the midst of it. Um, that was a relatively easy session. It was a challenging. The only I remember my song I remember was um, Come Together, where we basically played a, a, a duet, um, and which is like my, a lot of my music comes down to playing a duet between the bass and the vocal or the bass and the lead instrument. Comes a communication. This is what I, I don't listen to the drummer. I don't listen to the guitar player. I listen to the music. I listen to the vocal. I listen to the melody. And I'm supposed to support the melody in a way that's going to also keep the music alive and tell the story, you know, the emotion of the song, the emotion of the music, you know, the mission, complete the mission. So I was there to, to basically to function. And I just, you know, what I can do, if I can do something outside the box to do, make that happen, I'll do it. If not, I say within the box. I'm cool. I'm good with it. Now tell us about your spiritual life. You, I believe you have spent a lot of time in Buddhism. Am I correct? Yes, you're right. Most of my life. Really? Uh, Ken Curtis yeah, can started you, it. Can you talk about when? Yeah, what, what age did you start to discover that? Well, in 1971, um, August 13th, 8.30 p.m., Ken Curtis <laughs> was killed. Mm. Okay, and Norman Duggar called me that night and told me blow for blow exactly what happened. My father had just dropped him at just home. Just dropped him off, yeah. When yeah. he something to eat, by the time he got home, he heard on the news. He was having a party, and um, anyway, he got killed that night, and the next morning, he showed up in my house, floating above my kitchen cabinets. Really? Yeah. 
And at that point, I had a spiritual awakening. And so from that point on, I started looking for something bigger, bigger than myself, not bigger than myself, but an I started looking for answers. I went to Kundalini Yoga. I went to existentialism, um, agnosticism. I went through a, a lot of things to find out numerology, astrology, um, Kundalini Yoga. I finally found, thanks, thanks to Richard Davis, and it wasn't so much, it was um, my life at the time. I had suffered a serious car accident um, in 72. Roberta Flack, myself, and Cornel Dupree were damn near killed. Um, there was near, there was a, could have been a death issue. You know, we survived the death, basically. Another concussion, naturally. And I was out of it. I was whacked out of it. And Richard noticed he knew something was out, you know. And he said, Jerry, why don't you try chanting Nam Yoho and get killed? And I said, well, I'm fine. You know, of course, you get, you get knocked out. You always, I want to get play. You never, you know, the adrenaline, you don't feel the concussion. You don't feel anything. You know, you, the, lie, the brain lies to you, okay? Everything's okay. Everything's all right. You're doing fine, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I wasn't, but I didn't know it. Attempted to play after the accident. Didn't have much success. Um, Why? Why is that? I didn't you, play, in fact. You, you could you couldn't move your fingers anymore. Well, it was, um, it was, I mean, it's, it's these, um, I, the memory is this is such a long time ago. I remember not having any like proper rehab. Basically, it was on my own. This is like 1971, 1972. It was December 12, 1972, and I was introduced to Buddhism and. Uh, September of 73, basically, to cut the, you know, the basically, that's what nine months, 10 months later, time flies. I mean, I didn't realize it until I started writing my book, and I still haven't, don't have a grip on it, basically, um, because it happened so quickly um, between me, um, that happening, and my ability to um, play. The adrenaline, I thought I could play, but then I found out that I really couldn't. I had to start canceling jobs and just put it up after a while. Um, but but in the, during that point, I was um, had was introduced to true Buddhism. I started chanting. And so that got me through to all the, from that point on, I kind of put my life in perspective and knew it wasn't going to be the same, uh, but I was going to, you know, make a run of it.